Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that today we've got with us our first ever judge. It's Judge Ginger Lerner Wren, and uh, I'm so pleased to have you with us. Your work is exceptional because you're working to um, bring about the decriminalization of mental health issues within the, the U.S. justice system. So I'm, I'm very excited to have you on. I think it's a fantastic yeah. topic. Um, so can you tell us a bit ab about yourself and how you came to be in this rather unique position? I would love to, and it's really uh, a delight and a pleasure to be here. And, and honestly, uh, the work that you all do and the work that uh, Access is doing globally really goes hand in hand uh, with the work, believe it or not, that I'm doing uh, right here in my courtroom. So it's 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 a great it's a great fit and um, just a profoundly uh, important topic. But um, I'm actually speaking to you from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I am not in my courtroom. Uh, I must apologize for that, but we don't have uh, good signals in our courtroom, so I wasn't going to be able to get uh, a connection from my courtroom. But I work uh, basically just about uh, 10 minutes away from, from where I live, and I am in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And Fort Lauderdale, Florida is, uh, for your listeners and viewers, um, it's the southern part of, of Florida. It's South Florida and uh, not too far from the beaches, uh, very famous uh, beaches in the state of Florida and about 35 minutes from Miami. And, and a lot of your uh, audience might be familiar, of course, with Miami, even over Fort Lauderdale. But I am a county court judge in the state of Florida, and I have been uh, on the bench now for uh, just uh, about 19 years. And when I came to the judiciary, uh, I came uh, a long time ago. <laughs> I was much younger, and I came out of a civil rights um, uh, advocacy sphere working for disability rights florida which at the time had a different name and it was called the advocacy center for persons with disabilities inc and i ran for office i ran for office with delightful ice spiced individually wrapped gingerbread cookies and i always wanted to uh, be in public service and I always wanted to run for elected office. I just didn't really know which office for me would be the right fit, almost by a process of elimination and because of my intense uh, passion uh, for civil rights and for uh, policy. Uh, generally, I thought the judiciary actually would be a very good fit because justice um, overriding for me was a really paramount social justice was a paramount uh, desire for me to work on and so when I was working for disability rights I had a very unique role um, I was actually recruited to serve as a plaintiff's monitor on a federal class action over one of our regional psychiatric state hospitals in South Florida that serves essentially almost the southern half of the state. It had been under, a, uh, under federal litigation for many, many years because of conditions, lack of um, treatment, and all of the kinds of negative um, conditions that one would expect. Um, in a state psychiatric uh, institution, uh, particularly in the South uh, and particularly in a state which has, uh, which is at the bottom of funding for mental health in the entire United States of America. And so there was a settlement agreement after many, many years of litigation and negotiation. And this settlement agreement was really not only intended to um, enhance and improve all the conditions and treatment, et cetera, and civil rights for the residents and the patients 
at the hospital, but more importantly, it was intended to drive the individualized um, treatment discharge planning of the residents, of the patients or consumers, whatever language you choose, leaving the hospital into the community. And so the discharge planning process that I was uh, responsible for together with all the other implementation um, provisions of the settlement agreement all fell to me. So for over almost two years, I literally practically lived at the state hospital. Um, I was in charge of our entire class, which was all of the people evolving in and out of the state hospital. And it was my job to follow the individuals upon discharge, upon deinstitutionalization, if you will, into the community. And so I would assess, evaluate, and monitor uh, the quality or the lack of quality of the discharge plans and communicate directly back to our uh, general counsel and to the expert plaintiff's legal team that was quite interdisciplinary and incredibly expert um, in so that another phase of the settlement agreement could be triggered. So this deinstitutionalization technologies that I had to learn and that I learned from amazing experts like leaders, incredible leaders in our consumer mental health um, movement like Sally Clay, who just recently uh, sadly passed away just two weeks ago. Um, she was on the plaintiff's team. We had innovative um, mental health system of care people um, and technologies that were taken from Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation regarding uh, choice and a person-centered approach and um, just really uh, technologies and evidence-based practices uh, in terms of recovery and civil rights and consumer rights, et cetera, and systems of care that we're still talking about and trying to get implemented today. So in a nutshell, that was my training coming into the judiciary, a very unique skill set for an attorney that you wouldn't learn in law school. Uh, but I was a PAMI lawyer, and I'm proud to be a former PAMI lawyer for disability rights. And um, when I came to the bench, luckily our community was looking for change in our mental health uh, and criminal justice system. And it was a really uh, perfect um, kind of serendipitous uh, moment. Okay, for, for our audience outside of the United States, you said you were a particular type of lawyer? Yes. In the United States, we have a federal law that was passed by Congress first for uh, individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, civil rights uh, laws, uh, and then it was, super, and then it was uh, expanded to include uh, people with serious and persistent mental illness in the United States. It's called the PAMI Act, and it stands for um, um, pr uh, Protection and Advocacy of Individuals with Mental Illnesses. Ah, right, that is okay. the PAMI statute. Great. Uh, I, I know Antonio and Deborah have both uh, got a number of questions, so I'm going to hand over to Antonio first. Of course. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for for accepting this uh, this challenge. It's it, it's real nice to to have this conversation here today. Um, I would like to know if we uh, look to the United States, would you say that your the way how your court established is unique in in in, in the United States, or is there in other states you have something that could be equivalent to what you the work that you are doing there now? That's a terrific question, and thank you for asking it, Antonio. Um, the Broward County Mental Health Court that began in uh, May of 1997 was the very first mental health court 
in the United States. And of course, the court is not considered a program. We consider the court a human rights strategy. And it is a problem solving court which applies therapeutic jurisprudence. It is not an adversarial process. The problem we were trying to overcome in the United States was the unjust uh, criminalization of people with serious mental illnesses and related substance use disorders and neurodiversity types of disorders being arrested simply, largely, because they cannot get access to treatment services and housing. So uh, I think it's a, it's a hugely important point because certainly even in, in the UK we see large proportions of the prison population uh, have mental health issues or have neurodiverse conditions. Huge number of people with dyslexia are in prison. Um, Absolutely. And, and again, people who are um, not able to communicate. Uh, in, a, in a way that, uh, that would enable them to stay out of jail, tend to end up in jail, even though the, 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 the misdemeanors are quite minor. And that's right. And we have a, a large homeless population. Uh, you know, family erosion occurs when there's unmet, um, you know, treatment for people with mental illnesses. That's one of the consequences. And we really wanted to use the court similar in a way to the drug court model, but different. So we did borrow some uh, philosophy from the first drug court in the United States, which happened to be implemented in Miami in 1989. But it was really the therapeutic jurisprudence model that asks the question, can courts become agents of healing? Can courts of law act as an agent of healing? That is the, that is the theoretical hypothesis and question uh, and science behind the law reform movement, and it is a movement all over the world, of therapeutic jurisprudence. And I'm very proud to say that TJ came right out of the University of Miami, uh, right here in the state of Florida uh, in the in the mid uh, and late 80s. Excellent, thank you. Deborah, I know you've also got a question. I have a thousand questions and I'm um, just, I'm, t I'm just really, really excited to have you on today because I think the work that you're doing it, it, you know, speaking from the United States, it is so critical. We see over and over again um, our legal system, our, you know, misunderstanding. There's just been some horrible stories of the misunderstanding between, you know, people with disabilities, people with severe mental health issues and our, our police and our legal system and, you know, people of color, you know, being, you know, there, there's just so many problems in our beautiful, amazing country here in the United States. And it's, sure. and, and I think, yeah, I think some of the things that, you know, the privacy, privatization of the prison system in the United States, it's, um, we like to say sometimes in the United States, we're number one, we're number one. But the reality is we don't want to be number one of putting our, um, our citizens in jail. And right now we put more people in jail than any other country in the world. And I think that's, um, that, that, that's really um, something that a lot of Americans are very disturbed by. So I and, and, I, and, and for good cause, and I'm very happy to know that that debate, you know, is really uh, so enhanced here. And we're really, I, I, I think that the reform efforts, you know, are moving in a very nice uh, pace. We could do better particularly for individuals with disabilities, but the, but to reduce mass incarceration in the United States, you know, I really, really applaud, you know, the activism that's going on. I do. I do as well. And it's nice to see, quite frankly, because judges are so important in the United States. I, I, they are everywhere, but very, very, very important in people in the United States. So it's um, it's very it's just wonderful to see you being so active in these conversations. I would be very curious. You told us a little bit about your background, but what led you here? I mean, what is your story? Tell us why you are such a powerful 
advocate in this space because there's usually a very interesting story behind that. There is. I, I can't even believe that you asked that. It's so intuitive. Um, there is. You know, I was. Uh, I got my break. I got a break. I always wanted to be a public interest lawyer. I couldn't get a break. Uh, my big break came when I was appointed to become uh, to serve as what's called a public guardian for Broward County, and that was for adults who mostly in adults who were elderly but they had all kinds of various disabilities, of course. Um, and I was their legal guardian. And I was also the administrator and director of a, it was a probate court program. The best, one of the greatest jobs I ever had. Loved it. So I was responsible for the health, the safety, the economic benefits, the social welfare, for the protection, the advocacy, of all of these adults, I had three case managers that I oversaw. It was a small program. I took my own caseload. So I became a social worker also, plus a lawyer, plus a director, so that I could expand the reach of the services because we had a ratio under our statute 40 to 1. We couldn't take over 40 individuals to every case manager. So my, my uh, caseload of people for example, were people, adults with developmental uh, disabilities and neurodiverse uh, types of problems. Great job. Um, I learned, I was on the ground. I, I love to be embedded in the community. I am a community girl. I mean, I live and breathe in the community, going into facilities, nursing homes, ALFs, you name it. I live in it. That's where I choose to be. It gives me the greatest joy uh, in the world. And while I was doing this uh, work for this program, during the course of about 10 days, I had a very uh, unusual, disturbing experience that led me to believe that I needed to make a change in my life. And that is that three families came to my office unannounced, no appointment, in absolute emotional distraught conditions, begging me to take care of, it was either their mother who had schizophrenia, or their daughter, or their son. And each family came to me begging and pleading me, pleading with me to take care of their loved ones because they could not find any treatment or help for them. And for some reason, they all said strangely and oddly to me the same thing. They said, somebody told me that you could help us. And I'm thinking, well, who would say that? Who would say that this program is not for people who have any family members. It's for adults who are declared um, incapacitated under our guardianship laws, who have no family and no relatives. So that was an eligibility issue. So who would say that? And I said, well, I'm sorry. I, I sat down with these families and I spent time with them. I didn't understand why they couldn't get any help. It was the early 90s. I was in my early 30s. I didn't know very much. But by the time I said goodbye to the last family group, that had come to see me and they were, I remember them walking down the corridor in the building right next door to where I sit. I said to myself privately, I made a promise to me. And I said, if I have any, any opportunity, because these people don't have the energy, they are totally emotionally, you know, distressed. They don't know how to advocate. They don't know how to, navigate they right. don't know who to call they need a voice they need more energy and i said if i could help i will these people these families within three weeks i got the invitation to go to work at the state hospital and i went i didn't ask why i didn't question it i put in my resignation and I went to the state hospital uh, <laughs> to do that work. And that, Deb, that is the reason. It was the fact that 
these families were suffering so that they needed all the help they can get. I didn't know I would ever be a judge. I didn't know if I could ever deliver anything, but I knew they needed helpers. And that was really the essence of the story. So, so in other words, it was, so in other words, it was about servant leadership and following your path. And kudos to you for listening to that. I'm sorry, Antonio, I accidentally talked over you. No, Go no, ahead. No, I was I was going that this is a type of work that came up from intuition. That's what I yes. was. Yeah. It was intuitive. It was what I would describe, certainly, as very inspired. Uh, we talk about that all the time. If you listen to the whispers, if you are able to listen to the whispers, as Oprah Winfrey always talked about, um, and I heard it loud, and I heard it clear, and I kept my promise, and I'm glad I did. And I'm and glad, we're glad I did. you did. We're yeah. glad you did too. No, uh, Absolutely. So can I can I just interject briefly? So um, we have a similar office of the Public Guardian in the UK. Um, again, we, people have enduring power of attorney or lasting power of attorney because they the things differ. But how do you foresee scaling what you do? Because we do need people to take on that kind of responsibility for um, advocating for people that haven't got the um, capabilities to advocate for themselves or the energy or, you know, because as you said, the knowledge. yeah, the knowledge, right. the understanding of systems. So how, how can we scale that? Because you're, you're well, I think that's that's right. I mean, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where the system change becomes that transformative policy system change, that cultural change, you know, becomes so so important. Because in the United States, up until the time that Broward and my community, by the way, it's not about one person. It's never about one person. This is about a community that came together and decided that they had a thirst for justice that had to be quenched. They had a thirst for justice that this blind jailing of individuals who needed to be in humane treatment programs and whether it's hospitals or, or in the community in terms of access to care, we're talking access, that we had to do something that the, and the, I happened to come to the bench. I was trained in deinstitutionalization. We didn't have any money. We still don't get any money. But together, these community providers, the mental health treatment providers, the substance abuse treatment providers that formed a task force and met for two years while I was at the state hospital working and in the community working, following people around to see how they were doing, advocating. They were meeting in the courthouse for months and what turned into years to try to figure out a solution. They couldn't figure out a solution. They wanted to streamline what was happening in our local jail system to people with mental illnesses. Finally, the public defender who leads our public defender's office Howard Finkelstein finally said, what do you want? I want my own court. They knew I was coming. They knew I, I had a special skill set. And I think it was what they kind of looked at as a leap of faith. Let her give it a go. Uh, and sure enough, even without any money or grants or funding, together we created a structural pathway to take people out of jail who needed emergency acute care, who needed housing, who needed treatment in a community setting, and we use the court as a therapeutic and a human rights strategy to just really take people from an inappropriate system to one that is appropriate. Now, the cultural change piece is, is critical. We have to get funding for our community systems of care. We need to be prioritized. People with neurodiversity 
disabilities and all people with disabilities from a dignity level, but more than that, they need excellence in access to care and services through choice. Yeah. Antonio, cutting you across before. No, um, I, um, in, in the country that I'm from, in Portugal, we, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, we have discriminalized drugs. So uh, people are, you no. Know, it, it means that uh, people uh, who are in that situation, they are being sent to treatment and to, they are sent to a hospital. And so in, in the cases that you, ha that you have, have been over the years, what is the impact uh, or percentage, if you, if you have that, of course, of people in, uh, who, have, who have a disability and for somehow their lives also related with, with drugs? Uh, how, can you t tell us a little bit about that how, and how can that is being fixed in your court? I can. I just want to go back also about the scalability for one second. You know, the court, Broward's court was the model for uh, congressional legislation back in 2000 to seed these courts and to grow these courts. You know, now there's hundreds and hundreds of behavioral health courts and drug courts and veterans courts, which are really all hybrids to offer treatment over punishment, some better than others. Most don't take a human rights approach. They need to, uh, they really need to take a, a human rights approach, a framework uh, so that so that they do no further harm through a criminal justice process. But, but the question, Antonio, that you're talking about is, look, we have thousands of drug courts. It's a very popular problem solving court in the United States on the juvenile level now on the adult levels. Our problem in the United States uh, is right now that we are in one of the worst opioid uh, pandemics uh, in terms of heroin and synthetic drugs and opioid prescription um, addiction. Uh, we've got 19 deaths a, a, a 19 deaths an hour. Um, from overdoses in the United States. We are in a public health emergency here. So the idea that, yeah, we know treatment works. I, I believe treatment works. I know our recidivism rate is excellent. Um, when people get the kind of care that they need, when it's precise, when it really meets their level of care needs and people are you know, under, take responsibility for their recovery, you know, all good. But we've got problems that are much larger than just the core public health problems. We've got problems over poverty. We've got problems over people, you know, that still because of stigma can't get or won't seek care. And more than that, we've got a terrific, terrific amount of unemployment, still underemployment, and uh, a lot of racial um, tensions that are blocking individuals, for example, from being able to have these opportunities to succeed. And so all of these intersections um, of disparities in health, disparities in education, disparities in wealth um, are really all, you know, having all of these uh, you know, just confluence around gun violence and other violence and incarceration. So we've got a lot of work to do on the root cause level of really meeting the social and economic tensions and needs that we have in the United States. Yes, I, I, I think you're not alone. Um, I think there's a, an awful lot of underlying tension um, in, in, in most Western democracies that, that's been building for a long time. Uh, the, the, the cost of inequality and the cost of, um, of a penal system that, that, that penalizes illness is, is, is significant and, and I think still growing. So I really salute the work that you're doing. I've, I've got yes. a, a question. I've got a question, and I know Deborah's also got some questions. Um, so, how do people, because you've got all of these specialist courts, how do people get referred? Because obviously, it's preferable 
uh, for someone with a mental health issue to come through your doors than to go through a normal court's doors. But if they are in real um, distress, how are they going to say, I need to go to the mental health court? Well, you know, and a couple of things. You know, not all mental health courts, unfortunately, are the same. And some of them are more punitive than others. And these, my, of course, I mean, who knew that our court would even be duplicated? Nobody thought about that. We didn't even know we, even know, we didn't even know it never had been done before. We didn't think about that. But the idea that it's not a crime to have a mental health diagnosis is very, very important. And in terms of referral, well, certainly locally, you know, we made it very open and easy. Anybody can call our office. Uh, we can, our dockets are spontaneous. Um, we cast a wide net. We like to offer our services to, uh, you know, as many people as we can. Ours is a, is a misdemeanor, low level type of a court. I think we can see more people. We can deal more with less risk. We know the target, that uh, population that we're looking for. And it's a very easy uh, referral process. Just call up anybody, judges, family members, lawyers, case managers, social workers, people in the jail system, you know, anybody can call up and refer in and we will put them right on the docket uh, immediately. Skype has died on me. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So, Considering the, fa- the 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 unique position that you were in in the beginning of your career, and to see how the this the 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 judge career go- is currently in the United States, and if if or if even if you are uh, someone that is a law student, um, have you have the chance to go to universities and tell your story and engage with law students? If you did, what type of think that this story can impact on them and the way how they can start to see their careers in a different way. Yeah, I, that's so important. You know, I, I love the law, but you know, for a lot of law students, they have a certain expectation of what the law is and what law practice is all about. And a lot of, there's a very, I don't have the data, I apologize, but a large percentage of law students come out, uh, they go into the workplace or they can't find jobs or they're disappointed that the law is not giving them the gratification that they were hoping for. And when I speak to law students, I wanna make sure they understand that problem solving justice is a really now a very popular uh, field and that you can make a difference in the law and you could be innovative and you could innovate justice. Not that long ago, uh, I was uh, selected uh, as the third top finalist from the Hill Foundation um, for the mental health court in the Netherlands. And you could innovate justice. You know, now it's an open field. Therapeutic jurisprudence gives law students and lawyers and judges an opportunity to be creative in terms of problem solving through the law and justice innovation from a human rights vantage point i think is one of the most exciting aspects of becoming a lawyer so just knowing that there's a judge that's giving law students permission to uh, go out there and be a social justice entrepreneur, be a social justice agent of change, you know, is just, I think, a terrific message. Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. Um, I was going to ask you a question, uh, um, sort of, do- and it dovetails off of what Antonio said, but we were really, really surprised to find you on Twitter. We were very oh. surprised and, yeah, and, delighted, <laughs> and delighted because, and I love what you're saying, you know, um, justice innovation and social justice entrepreneur. I think we haven't seen enough of, you know, people like you in these conversations and it's very, very exciting. And I think 
this is where we're going to see great social change. But tell us, why did you join social media? And by the way, you know, we're all big fans of social media, but we really, really applaud that. We really applaud Thank you. that. Yeah, well, it, it came up because I was nominated uh, for the social uh, justice. I was participating in that Justice Innovation Challenge from the Hague Institute for the internationalization of law. And they had a third phase of the challenge that was a global, like, American Idol vote. Cool. Oh, really? And if you came in top three, Deborah you got an automatic trip to The Hague to participate in the Justice Innovation Con Conference. And then you gave an e-pitch, like a Shark Tank e-pitch, to the judges for your nomination. And I was nominated, of course, for what they called a therapeutic court that screens mental health. That's what it was called. Um, I had to figure out a way to get votes from a social media vantage point, and I started by leveraging LinkedIn, and okay. then I got, from LinkedIn, I went into Twitter because Huffington Post invited me to start contributing um, after the social, um, after the Hague Challenge. Um, and so one thing just kind of led to another. Now I'm writing on therapeutic justice for the Huffington Post, and it's like, well, now you have to share it. Right. So it, once again, as Neil, I mean, as Antonio had said earlier, it's about following your passion, listen to those whispers and figuring out how you were meant to make a difference in the world. And all of us are doing that. But um, Neil, um, do you want to I know that we're at the end of our time, but I feel like you didn't get a chance to say much. Do you want to ask the final question or comment? So, so I, I am. If you can still hear me, um, we can. We can hear oh, you. Good. OK, great. So um yeah, I'm 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 very interested. Obviously, you've you've got the international experience of, of of coming out to the Hague, and you've been doing the stuff on 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 social media, uh, which is as as Deborah's kind of pointed out already, very unusual um, to to see people in the justice profession on on social media. How do how do you think you can coach your fellow professionals in the legal profession to to or encourage them to sort of dip a toe in the water because it can seem quite scary at first it is it's extremely scary and um i wanted to make sure that you know you have to be careful uh because there's tremendous ethical considerations that we have to ensure um that you don't cross over and that's not exactly very clear lines so I encourage my colleagues to uh, get on Twitter, but if you do, you know, don't do any personal content. Uh, I don't do any original content. If you notice, I'm always just doing public policy, uh, social justice kinds of sharing with reports and articles and data and research or my own work that I write, which is all policy. I don't, I don't you don't hear me editorialize, you don't hear me really in my own voice, other than what I'm sharing, which is all authoritative research uh, yes. and things like that. And I think that it's, that's how you educate, that's how you educate people about what's happening in the juvenile justice system or what's happening in the mental health and in the, in, the, in the problem solving therapeutic area and about poverty and the law and about you know, why it's important for judges and courts, you know, not, you know, to really pay attention to individuals who are experiencing toxic stress because they're in financial straits and what the courts can do to support the community, you know, from all of these areas. And I think that being on Twitter is the future. We finally got some clearance to do that from um, the judicial canons, but you have to, as you said, Neil, you know, you have to start slow. You have to be cautious. And uh, that's the advice I would give. Excellent. Uh, it's been a fantastic chat. I'm really, really pleased that you joined us. We've, we've hit the end of our time. So um, I'd like to thank you once again, Judge Ginger. Thank you all. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.